Good morning, church. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm going to pray over us as we begin our, our act of worship, as, as we step into God's presence. God, good morning. Thank you for the time that we get to set everything aside and to walk into your presence. God, our prayer this morning is that you would make us a place that you would delight to dwell. There's folks in this room that got some bad news this week. There's folks in this room that haven't gotten any news. And folks that have gotten some great news. And God, we thank you that you are the king regardless of that. God, we trust you. We know that you are for us. I just pray that we would sing out these truths this morning, knowing that you are for us. God, we love you. We praise you. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. There is one salvation, one doorway that leads to life, one redemption, one confession. I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe in the crucifixion. By his blood, I have been set free. I believe. The resurrection, hallelujah, his life is destiny. Sing it out. In all praise to God the Father, all praise to Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit. Our God has overcome the King who was in. have heard or eyes have seen. I believe that the day is coming. He's preparing to claim his bride. Light the altar, keep it burning. See the Lamb who rose a roaring light. In all praise to God the Father, all praise to Christ the Son.
praise this morning. Can we lift up? Sing that one more time. In all praise to God the Father. All praise to Christ. There was a moment when the lights went out When death claimed its victory The king of love had given up his life The darkest day in history There on a cross they made for sinners For every curse his blood atoned One final breath and it was finished But not the end we could have known For the earth began to shake and the veil was torn. What a sacrifice was made as the heavens rolled.
to be hailed, that every knee will bow at one point, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that you are Lord. And the chance that we get to worship that Savior and that King is just an honor. God, I pray for our service this morning, that we would focus in on what you have for us, um, that we would learn from your word. We love you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us. Before you have a seat, greet those around you, introduce yourself, uh, and then we'll get into it. All right, well, good morning. Let's read our passage for this morning. So we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, but I, brothers could not address you as spiritual people, but as of the flesh, as of infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you're not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there's jealousy and strife among you, you are not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way. For when one says, I follow Paul, another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos, what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field God's building. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. So the issue of carnal Christianity or thinking in the flesh uh, comes up in our passage today. And um, <clears throat> it's interesting how this topic was introduced last week with the idea of the natural person and the spiritual person. And then, but we have the mind of Christ, right? And so there's this concept that you can be a believer. Have any of you met a believer and then you're sort of shocked at something they did or said, right? Have any of you professed to know Jesus and then been shocked at something that you did or said, right? You notice that? So there's that, that idea there. Yesterday, I was shocked that I went biking yesterday. And so I was, it was like going down that, that trail up by the Susquehanna. And I came up upon a groundhog who had his back to me and he's just standing on the edge and just was had, he was so enthralled in whatever he was eating down there with his head down. He didn't even know I was coming, right? So I thought, this is kind of cool. And I went up next to him and just rang the bell really loud and ah, I freaked him out. He took off running. I think he wet himself. And, and, then, and then I thought, like, that's mean, right? That's kind of, that wasn't very kind. So I find myself sometimes doing things that maybe aren't really kind or thoughtful or, or not doing certain things. And so when we're talking about spiritual maturity, I would say to you that it's not binary, that now I'm, I, I wasn't mature and now I'm mature, but that it's, it's, um, it's cyclical and there's a process involved. I think when COVID hit, we all were surprised at how immature we can think in some ways, like it showed where our idols are and what's really important to us and it kind of revealed certain things. So there are seasons in life, right? But it's good to understand um, our own spiritual journey and um, this idea of what is, a, what is an immature Christian and, and how can I avoid that? And then what is a mature Christian? How can I cultivate um, spiritual growth in my life? So the, ma the main thing today would basically be to cultivate um, spiritual growth. That's the big idea, to cultivate your life for growth. How can I cultivate my life for growth? And we have like agricultural terminology today. So I brought a little plant with this idea that you can't make a plant grow, but you can cultivate 
things that can help it along the way to grow. So in verse 1, we're going to start in with some of the markers of immaturity, basically. Spiritual immaturity, number one, is stinky, all right? Bear with me here. So he's talking to believers, I, brothers and sisters, so he's talking about um, Christians, um, can address you as spiritual people, meaning someone who can discern God's perspective in things by the mind of Christ or the Spirit of God, right? But I can address you as spiritual people on that level, but more as being of the flesh or just on your natural level, like that there's not that spiritual component that's there. And it's been like about five years since I came and planted this church here in Corinth, and I wish that I could address you from like that there had been more growth there, but there just isn't. And maybe they were predisposed to just being in a really difficult city. I mean, the, the city prided themselves in how smart they were, how educated, all these people with wisdom and philosophy. And then they were also like prostitution and religion were mixed together. And so there's a lot of um, people who, were, who inherited just the tendency to be driven by lust, right? And so they're just not as far along as, as the potential that is there. And so it's kind of like they're, they're, they're five years down the road, but I have to treat you like infants. Now, have any of you ever changed a diaper? I, like, I can remember the first one. It took forever, you know. Um, the nurse was laughing at me at the hospital. But um, th then you get good at it. But if, if one of my kids, when they were five years old, I had to change their diaper, unless there was a disability, of course, but like if it's a normal kid, five years old, and, and you have to change their diaper, you start to get resentful, right? It's like, oh man, come on, you should know how to dispose of this. And so there's this, this imagery here where he's like saying, hey, you, you should really be further along, and it's kind of, it's getting to be a little bit stinky here, because you're representing who Jesus is, but um, I need to kind of go back to that stage of infancy, and it shouldn't be that way. There's factions in the church. Um, you're, you're priding yourselves in human wisdom. You're not really thinking um, spiritually. Um, you're succumbing to lust. Um, you're struggling in, in worship and how you love each other. And so he addresses them. So it's a little bit stinky. The second thing I notice in verse 2 is that spiritual immaturity is not just stinky, but it's actually um, related to diet, right? It's he uses this idea, I've fed you, i fed you, i fed you. Um, and I fed you with milk, but not solid food for you weren't ready for it. And so this idea of nourishment, the basic ideas of what cultivates um, Christian growth are um, reading the Bible, uh, praying, and having, having time to meditate on that. So you read and you meditate on it. Um, Christian Friendship or fellowship, if you're isolated and you're not connected with others in processing, that's not cool. And then to obey God, like when he asks you to do something that you're obeying. And if you don't, then you confess that and get back on track. That's, that's just the basic of like Christian growth. And I've, I've fed you with milk. I've been, so there's the concept that if you don't have spiritual strength and energy, then, then the basic idea of you're not feeding yourself properly have you ever seen images of Auschwitz or a concentration camp? They haven't physically been eating. Spiritually, you haven't been eating. That's what you look like spiritually. You have no energy, no strength, right? And then he makes a distinction here between uh, milk and solid food. So what is that, right? <laughs> What's the difference between milk, the milk of the word, and solid food? So that reminded me, I, I started digging this week a little bit, um, Hebrews chapter 5 addresses the difference, the topic of milk and solid food. Hebrews 5, you need milk, not solid food. It's that, it's that issue again. And then in Hebrews 6, therefore let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. So, what I understand of milk is, is the, the elementary and foundational good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes, thank you, God, for how much you love me. I, I'm not going to get to heaven on my own merit. I'm put, putting my faith in you, Jesus. And so the milk, if you were to kind of lay it out, some of those things would be turn to Jesus who died for your sins. 
Put your faith in Jesus. Uh, do church things. Get prayed for. Appreciate the resurrection. Know that God will judge the world. Like th- These are the elementary things. This is milk. And so if you go to church and it's, it's, it's just the milk, right? It's like, I love chocolate milk. I love strawberry milk. This church is amazing. And we just love Jesus. We worship Jesus. But you never get into meat then um, th- there's, a, there's somehow a lack of ability to be able to grow beyond that. I would have wanted you to have more meat <laughs> to grow, but uh, we're just going to stick with the elementary, Jesus loves you, you're born again, you're going to heaven kind of thing. So then he gets into um, describing a little bit of the depth of um, solid food in verse uh, 5, uh, chapter 5, verse 13. Everyone who lives on milk is, now watch this, unskilled in the word of righteousness. So there's a lack of skill there when there's just milk. And then he goes on to describe in verse 14, solid food is for the mature. For those who have their, and and this is where we're going to linger today a little bit, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So now he's actually describing for us what it means to have spiritual maturity and growth in your life that is based on the the solid engagement with the word of God that gives you the power of discernment by constant practice and training, right? To let your gospel identity in Jesus trickle down into discerning the day-to-day things that are good and bad for you. And now we're letting the beauty of the gospel of Jesus trickle down and start to transform the different areas of our lives. And we need discernment to do it. It's kind of like the idea that the Bible is not for information, it's for transformation. That we're just using the Bible as a gateway into hearing from God and allowing Him to transform us. And, and it's interesting, the, the Bible does not describe you getting to heaven through your works or your how religious or through behavioral modification, it describes the importance of you cultivating um, what it takes for growth. God is the one who gives growth, but I want to cultivate the environment for that, right? I am the vine, you are the branch. Abide in me. I want to abide there. And so then the nourishment of who God is begins to flow into my life and fruit then just appears, right? You You don't see the grapevine straining and then all of a sudden, boop, Oh, there are some grapes over there. It's like, no, no, no. It just happens because there's been a cultivating that's been going on. So here the cultivation is described that we're allowing the powers of discernment trained by constant practice to trickle down so I can distinguish, this is actually good for me. This is not good for me. And I can be able to understand that, okay? James says it this way, that someone who reads the word of God and then just walks away and doesn't make any changes is like someone who looks in a mirror and you see, oh my gosh, I have like a major, I have a zit there or whatever. I was like, you should do something about that ah, and just walk away. No. And so he's describing the importance of letting our gospel identity trickle down into how we handle the situations that we deal with. So to let the powers of discernment be there, the idea of meat could be, and here's a little bit of a, a list of what this can look like. I can identify um, good and, and evil easier through, um, through my reading scripture and then meditating on it, right? And so I start to, uh, I start to recognize um, there, are, there are surface sins and then there are root issues, right? Like, uh, it's not good to lash out at, at your spouse and get, get angry about something, but what's the root issue? What is the idolatry behind that? Well, it's not good for you to view pornography on, on the internet and to get sucked into that, but that's a symptom of a deeper issue. What is, what is the root issue? And so, so by training and discernment, it, the, it starts to trickle down, right? And you start to gain a little bit more understanding of good and evil. And then you start to say, I, I, I'm able to start applying the things that I'm, that I'm learning here and I'm getting better at what it means to follow Jesus and not to run to another functional savior, but to say, hey, what does it mean here to really pursue Jesus in this? I can sense the Holy Spirit starting to help me. Uh, Phil was describing this sense of joy that's there when there's a closeness with Jesus. And, and, and then automatically, um, you start just loving others. 
um, and loving God, and it's just a, a byproduct of having time in the meat. So Henry Nowen describes it this way, that um, if you don't have solitude and silence in your life, um, you can't live a spiritual life. It's possible that there are many American Christians who are, who are just bouncing from one YouTube video to the next and from one um, you know, crazy doctrine that flies out there and you're so vulnerable to the next wind of whatever trend comes, bouncing around on a surface level and without silence and solitude and really practicing what it means to hear from God, you're not, <laughs> like you're not really able to discern and, and really live a spiritual life. It has to trickle down. And so some, some of the areas could be just in your own gospel identity of um, what it means to, um, that when you're in Christ, you don't have to perform let that trickle down into all the different areas. Where, where, where do I come into a room and, and you know, fake who I am or try to perform or be something that I'm not? And, and to, to let the gospel, the identity of being um, in Christ take over in that. Um, to let gospel identity, uh, okay, I am a Christian and then let it trickle down into your workplace I'm, and some of you might say, I tend to be people-pleasing. I want to please my boss. I want to show others how good I'm, I am at, at what I do at work, right? And, but, but if you let your gospel identity trickle down, then when I go to work, I actually am here to please Jesus. I have an audience of one. I want to please him here at work. <laughs> or in your relationships, right? That um, there are relationships where we can be we can recognize I'm actually very self-centered and I'm using other people for myself. But in a, in a gospel identity, we realize, oh my goodness, Jesus came to, to, to serve and not to be served. And, and so it's like, man, who messed up the kitchen again? And why doesn't anyone empty the dishwasher? Oh, Jesus came to serve and not to be served. The Apostle Paul describes it this way at the end of his life. I'm being poured out like a drink offering. When you come to the end of your life, it's like I'm a dish rag. <laughs> I've been used up. And Jesus was that way. And so in my relationships, I don't want to be self-centered. I want to be others-centered. When it comes to forgiveness, to let the gospel identity, Jesus has forgiven me of everything. I, just, I need to be willing to forgive others. Let that trickle down, right? That's how we get into using the powers of discernment to let the gospel trickle down into, into our lives. And that's, you're starting to get into more of the solid part of that. In, our converse, in your conversations, um, do you try to impress people or can you, or can you just be honest and open in, in, in your community group when you're engaging around prayer requests? Can you have honest prayer requests or do you have to just kind of fake it? Pray for my uncle's hangnail. Then when it comes to like dealing with conflict, gospel identity, um, are you able to see the speck in your eye or do you always, uh, or in someone else's eye or do you, do you notice the log in your own eye like as you're dealing with conflict? And then like I mentioned in dealing with different addictions, I have this premise that we all have addictions um, and basically we're addicted to ourselves. And then um, different addictions can lead to heavy shame in your life. And Satan wants to get you there uh, to where uh, I call it capital G guilt. It's overwhelming guilt. And so some of you are in the room today and you just feel so, this overwhelming guilt. And a gospel identity would say, no, no, it's not capital G guilt. It's small g guilt. Um, the Holy Spirit is just prodding you enough and will turn up the heat just enough to help you to say, that was stupid. You know, how could I do this better next time, right? And so, but it's not this overbearing, like, um, uh, crushing guilt. That's, that's Satan. And so your gospel identity is that you're living on the righteousness of Christ. That's a donation that's been given to you. 
in your gospel identity. So what I'm saying is these things trickle down, right? And these are just examples of how we can, through reading and meditating on the Word of God, um, the Spirit begins to reveal these things for us. The example in the church at Corinth, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos. And so they basically, um, here in the U.S., I found that there's a celebrity culture. A lot of the churches in Austria are just like elder run and and. But here in the U.S., there's this celebrity tendency and a, a little bit of a consumer tendency. So it can feel like churches come into a movie theater. Let me come in. Let me just take this in a little bit, uh, hear a few encouraging words, and then go. And that's church, right? Church is actually, uh, let me flip it for a minute. Um, you're the minister in your community. Church is seven days a week, and you're actually the church. <laughs> oh. And uh, we spend an hour together just to, like, encourage each other and stay on point, right? And that we are to be disciple-making, right? And so that's the church. That's church. So, like, then here in the U.S., we, we kind of get our minds wrapped around um, the different types of church as well. Those Christians are uh, the intellectual Christians, you know. Well, the others are too shallow and... Um, and uh, then those who aren't as intellectual said, well, you're too heady and irrelevant. And then there are reverent churches versus the hipsters, right? And the hipsters are compromising the holiness of God, and the reverent ones, they're not authentic. And then emotion and worship, if you raise your hand in worship, it shows how much you love Jesus. And then others like, if you raise your hand in worship, it's weakness, man. Emotion is weakness. And then there are others who are like, hey, church is all about serving the community. we got to go serve the community. And others are like door to door. You need to accept Jesus or you're going straight to hell, right? Forget about serving the community. You need it straight up. So there's all these different factions going on of what church should look like. And everybody's talking about that. And it's like, no, 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 no. That's not church. You're a church. You're discipling people. But they're coming in for an hour and they're like judging, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. And it's a sign of spiritual immaturity, and it manifests itself in um, relationships within the culture. And it can leave a wake of division and faction, and it's a symptom of immaturity. So we want to cultivate growth in our lives. I'm going to kind of flip to finish out with um, marks of maturity. The first one is um, the servant. What then is Apollos or Paul? They're just servants whom you believe that the Lord has assigned. And so it's the idea here that um, a mark of spiritual maturity is to be willing to serve and to be a, a part of the body of Christ in some way and to identify yourself as that. That I identify myself as part of a local body. Um, I have a place in the body. I have spiritual gifts and I'm, I'm here as a servant and I'm here even if it costs me. Um, to follow the example of Jesus. So that's all that we are. There's no celebrities here, Paul, Apollos, or anyone else. We are all just servants. Second mark of maturity is the idea of um, being a cultivator. I planted Apollos water, but God is the one who gave the growth. No, nobody is anything. Like, you don't have, like, superhero Christians and others who, ha and, and, uh, who like, don't show uh, a lot of fruit up front. Um, it's actually... You can't take a plant like this and say, oh, watch this. Now that I'm really mature, I'm going to show you how you make a plant grow. And you just pull on it and make this thing grow, right? Is that how plants grow? <laughs> no. Yeah. You know it, right? That's not how plants grow. She's like, you're going to kill that thing. It's, but it's, it's God who, who gives the growth, right? One, one is planting, one is watering, and we're kind of cultivating. And then all of a sudden, it just begins to grow. And that's the idea of being a, a cultivator. So when we think of the blessed practices here at CFC, um, the blessed practices are not a guarantee that anyone comes to know Christ. Only God, right? Only God could do that. But man, we should be a church that, where we encourage cultivating, right? You should be praying for people who don't know Jesus. You should be listening to people even when your ear is hanging and you're like, I don't want to listen. Because people love to talk and that makes a connection. Um, you should be eating and having meals with people who don't know Jesus. You should be serving other people in the community. And you should be sharing the gospel when it comes, or at least share your personal story. This is what it was like before I knew God, and this is what he did in my life, right? We should be cultivating that CFC. And, and God does that um, 
as, as we're feeding and we're getting into the solid food, the Spirit of God begins to do that, but we become cultivators, and then God is the one who gives growth, right? The third mark of spiritual maturity is the idea of being a team player. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. That's personal between you and God. But we are fellow, God's fellow workers, God's field, God's building. Do you know, notice the terminology that it's using oneness and we, and that we've been invited to work together with God. We've become one with him. So you might not feel effective um, on your own. You might be discouraged on your own. But as a team, I'm excited about kids camp. I'm excited about what God might be doing, even if there's one child that turns to God at kids camp. I'm excited about that. I'm excited about the concept of teamwork, that I don't have to have all the gifts and abilities, that we have an elder board with different gifts, that we have staff with different gifts. I'm so grateful that I'm not Jason and that he's not me, right? And that we have all different abilities. And so we, we work as a team. And when one wins, we all win. When one's struggling, we all are struggling. And that there's this sense of, of oneness as a team, and that's a sign of spiritual maturity. Even your attitude towards church, is, is it shouldn't be in the morning like, we get, should we go to church or not? Do I feel like it or not? No, you're part of a team. And when you show up, it encourages others. And when you come in the room, it's not about you. Here I am. It's about here they are. Who needs to be prayed for today? Who needs an encouraging word from the Spirit of God today, right? That's church. <laughs> but, and that's, the, that's a sign of that we're maturing spiritually, right? That we come as servants and we're just cultivators. We're working together as a team. So I want to close today with um, the concept that we need to cultivate our lives for growth. And the way we do that, the big idea, cultivate your life for growth, and then the way we would do that is by surrender. And it's by regular surrender. It's by regularly weeding, if you will. What are the things that are starting to take root that I need to surrender back over to God? Um, John chapter 12 is a, a simple one. Unless a seed, a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it to eternal life. And I would say that's the secret sauce to spiritual growth right there, is that your understanding of the gospel, when it really trickles down, is like, Jesus, you're the boss. And I just believe in the room this morning, that, that there's a battle going on and that some of you have something that you know you need to surrender to God and you're wrestling with that. And so I want to give you some time to just process, all right? Let's just bow our heads and pray together. So Lord, we would invite you into this space right now to help us to process what it means to be able to grow spiritually and that there may be some in the room who need to surrender something today. Maybe we need to surrender our spiritual diet and we're not, we don't have things in place to be nourished. And so we don't grow. Maybe we need to surrender today. Um, the idea of significance that, that um, it's not about Paul or Apollos or anyone else. We, we need to um, lay something at your feet. Maybe we're wrestling with a relationship and we need to surrender that to you. And so I just pray that you would guide us as we're processing that. So just pray quietly. Maybe ask Jesus if he's leading you to surrender something this morning.
continue in worship with the song Resurrender, we invite you to stand. But if you feel like you need time to just sit with the Lord, you take that time. So if you want to stand, let's stand together and sing.
search our hearts and show us the parts that we do need to re-surrender. And if we're feeling embarrassed because it feels like we're constantly coming to you with that one same thing to re-surrender, I pray that we just rest in the comfort of your love. God, give us the strength to grow in you. We have so much hope read these words of Paul together, church from Ephesians 4. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Amen. Let's sing of the good, good gospel together. This is a newer song for us, but let's just declare these truths this morning. Oh, what a gospel, oh, what a peace, my highest. 
greatest joy in my deepest need. Now and forever he is my light. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. again. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Have a great day.